the talk is, uh, I'm going to start off basically with some motivation for what I'm going to talk about, um, which I probably don't need to spend too much time persuading you of. But really, the talk is about dealing with high dimensional data. Um, and the particular way I'd like to uh, deal with high dimensional data is with sort of low dimensional embeddings. So I'm going to talk briefly at the beginning about existing methodologies. And then uh, I'm going to focus on my work, which is this model called the GPLVM, Gaussian Process Latent Variable Model. What I'd like to do, this is where we'll get a bit technical, is, is do the mathematical foundations of the model. Um, and then there'll be examples. Now, I used to have a few different types of examples, but one of the areas this, this work has become quite popular in is vision and graphics. So I've stripped all the examples back to human motion animation examples, which means that they're kind of fun looking as well. Um, so those examples will be on that. And I've got an example that will run through the extensions as well. I apologize in advance if I go too fast at some point, because um, I'm going to be putting in extensions in fairly quickly. I don't think you necessarily want to know all the details, but it's just a way of trying to show you the sort of things this model can do. Um, and then obviously I'll round off with some conclusions. Okay, so just on another point, all source code and slides are available online. These slides aren't up yet because they've just been updated. And in fact, these toolboxes will probably change, but the updated slides will go up. Um, and this is so that you can recreate any of the examples I show in the talk if you are interested in MATLAB. You have to have MATLAB, but other than that, everything else is created. Okay, so high dimensional data. So high dimensional data is something in machine learning we're often interested in. And in fact, machine learning, uh, we're sort of somewhat obsessed with handwritten digits. So here is the only handwritten digit that will appear in the talk. It's a digit six. Um, it's 64 rows by 57 columns. Now, the space obviously contains a lot more than just this one digit. So if I take a random sample from this space, I see something like that. Now, that's nothing like the digit we've just seen. And indeed, if we were to continue sampling every nanosecond from now until the end of the universe, the probability of seeing the original six is something like 10 to the minus 9. So you just won't see it. Um, I'm making a rough guess of when the end of the universe will be. <laughs> um, there's a second sample. It wasn't the six, which is lucky. OK. <laughs> so uh, here's an alternative idea. Rather than modeling directly in that space, why don't we do something a little bit more intelligent? And what I'm going to suggest is a model of handwritten sixes by taking a prototype six. So here's a prototype six and rotating it. So I'm rotating it right, and I'm rotating it left. And indeed, what I can do is just show you with a little MATLAB demo. Now, what's going on here is I've taken the 6, and I've rotated it 360 times. And I've created a data set from these 360 6s. I'm then projecting that data set onto the second and third principal components of the data. And what you can see is it creates a nice circle with a little bit of noise, particularly this point just around there. Um, which is coming from sort of the bilinear interpolation or nearest neighbor interpolation that MATLAB's doing to rotate the digit. So we could be quite happy that if I take a prototype six, okay, and I've rotated it all the way around, but we've got a sort of one-dimensional manifold living in this high-dimensional space if we believe in that model of sixes, that it's one prototype six and it's being rotated. Now, of course, in practice, real digits can't be rotated all that way. So we might have something a little bit more like this, where we've got a prototype 6, which is being rotated for some portion. And then over the other side, it's a prototype 9. So that's just a sort of cheap way of trying to introduce the idea that perhaps the data is typically lives as prototypes in a high dimensional space on low dimensional embeddings. Now in practice, of course, rotation of a, of a digit like that, that's just in case the demo doesn't work, rotation of that digit like that is just far too simple for a model of the digit. In practice, of course, digits undergo thinning, translation, and rotation, various other transformations. Um, but what I'm going to argue is that for data with structure, um, and by that I mean sort of for most data we're interested in, if we're interested in the data set, we typically believe it has some sort of structure we can extract. Um, for data with structure, we expect fewer distortions and dimensions for high dimensional data. We therefore expect the data to live on a sort of lower dimensional manifold. And that's the motivation for the work that follows. So the conclusion is to deal with high dimensional data by looking for a lower dimensional nonlinear embedding. 
Now, I'm not obviously the first person to suggest this. So here I just want to mention briefly, spectral approaches are obviously important for Google. Um, spectral approaches to this sort of problem, classical multidimensional scaling is a very important one. Um, that's sort of my favorite reference on it, Mardia 79. Um, then you're using eigenvectors of a similarity matrix and you're projecting onto those eigen, the dominant eigenvectors. Isomap um, is a sort of multidimensional scaling. This is a sort of approximation for geodesic distance. Uh, geodesic distance. It's used in multidimensional scaling and there's a particular proximity matrix, but it can be viewed as a type of multidimensional scaling. Kernel PCA is interesting. Uh, it says here it provides a low dimensional representation, but actually typically with the typical kernels that are used, it actually explodes the dimensionality of the um, data. So if it's the number of eigenvectors is the dimensionality, and if you use an RBF kernel, you have n eigenvectors. So it's not really a low dimensional um, embedding for typical kernels. I'd like to know a kernel where it is a low dimensional embedding. That would be interesting. But it also comes with a mapping. So it's sort of the same methodology as MDS, but it comes with a mapping for free. Sorry. Um, <laughs> so that provides a low dimensional embedding, well, a high dimensional embedding, really, in the mapping. Locally linear embedding is another interesting model that looks to locally preserve relationships in the low dimensional. Well, it depends how you look. You could say that kernel PCA is just a specific case of classical multidimensional scaling. Yes, but for the kernels, the particular kernels for LLE and the particular kernels for, um, oops, that's my laptop. For, uh, well, isomap and LLE and also semi-definite embedding, which is another really interesting method I haven't mentioned. They're very difficult. You don't get that mapping out easily. You can't just map a new point in. So in some sense, I view them, I view what's new with kernel PCA as getting the mapping. You don't, with LLE, get a mapping. You could try and look, but it's not clear. It's not an explicit mapping from the high dimensional space to the low dimensional space. So in my head, and, and this might be just my perspective on it, in my head, kernel PCA is the specific case where you get a mapping out. Because classical multidimensional scaling existed a lot further before, and you could view that as for the case of positive definite similarity measures is just a kernel PCA as well. I think it's a bit unfair on the statistician too. <laughs> We've been doing that for a while. So yes, I would agree. I mean, I'm just taking the perspective that um, kernel PCA is the case where you have a mapping. So the, the, the question is there, well, if you've got a mapping, do you have a, a way of getting a low dimensional embedding? I think that would be an interesting answer. OK, so um, there's also iterative methods. So these are within the same family, but there's sort of um, versions of multidimensional scaling where you don't solve it uh, with a spectral solution. Um, iterative optimization of stress functions, uh, classical stress is a well-known one. Salmon mappings, um, and salmon mappings aren't really a mapping because they're, they're just sort of type of iterative MDS, but the, the terminology is misleading because there's no mapping involved there. Uh, Neuroscale is an interesting sort of early machine learning community example of visualization, which took or augmented iterative MDS techniques with a neural network. So you've got the mapping in there as well as the uh, MDS, and that's sort of a NIPS 97 thing. OK, I'm not interested in those. I'm not going to go into the details why I'm not interested in them, but some of them will come out as we go through the talk. I'm interested in probabilistic approaches, and none of those are probabilistic in the sense that I can write down a likelihood of my data given the model. So probabilistic approaches, if we go for probabilistic approaches, then we're sort of uh, in the realm of probabilistic PCA. Now probabilistic PCA is a linear method, so it's not sort of as interesting as the things we saw on the previous slide. Um, we can also go for density networks. Now these are a model sort of proposed by Mackay in 95, where you use important sampling to go through a multi-layer perceptron. And I think it's useful if I just go to the board. OK, so latent variable modeling. I like graphical models, but really simple graphs. Um, so Y is, in our notation, going to be the data set. And X is going to be the latent variable. 
Now, in latent variable modeling, what we're assuming is we've observed y, and we're given and we, the latent variable that um, is, y is dependent on is x. So what we have is some relationship between y and x. So I'm going to write that p of y given x, and then maybe some parameter to w. So this is a mapping from x to y. So y is typically low dimensional, we we'll call it two dimensional, and x is typically uh, sorry, x is typically low dimensional, two dimension, and y is typically high dimensional, d dimensional. Now in standard latent variable models, you place a prior distribution over your latent variable p of x. You combine it with this p of y given x comma w and you marginalize to obtain p of y given w. Then you'll optimize over the parameters of your mapping. So this, in this work here, probabilistic PCA, what Tipping and Bishop showed is sort of specific. The model was proposed independently by these guys. But um, what Tipping and Bishop specifically showed is that the maximum likelihood solution for this model, if, this, this, uh, if the mapping from here to here is linear, and the noise on the, out, uh, the output is uh, spherical covariance, this is PCA. So they call that probabilistic PCA. Now, that's nice, but if you want a nonlinear method, you have to turn to something like density network. Now, the problem occurs now is you end up with a prior distribution in the latent space and a nonlinear mapping to an observed data set. Now, that means you start perhaps with a Gaussian prior over the x as you do for probabilistic PCA. But when you take this nonlinear mapping to y, you basically lose the Gaussianity. And you can no longer marginalize x. That's intractable. So what Mackay proposed is use important sampling in the x space. You take samples from P of x, and you map them through using a multilayer perceptron he used. And you then look at the likelihood of those samples using the important sampling technology to get your posterior over x. Now that's nice and it works, but important sampling only works in low dimensional spaces. So Typically, you could go up to sort of two-dimensional spaces with x. And to get a nice posterior distribution, you have to sample very densely. The generative topographic mapping, which is by uh, Chris Bishop and Marcus Spence and Chris Williams, was very similar to this. But they used a re uh, regularly spaced out grid-based sample in the latent space and an RBF network to map to y. And what they could show with that is that was related to a probabilistic interpretation of the self-organizing map. But I see it as a sort of child of density networks. So the difficulty for probabilistic approaches is to propagate this probability distribution through a nonlinear mapping, because you can't marginalize once you've done that. And that's what we're going to do today by some tricks. So what I'm presenting, the new model, is a probabilistic nonlinear PCA. See, PCA has a probabilistic interpretation, and that's by Tipping and Bishop, but it's very difficult to nonlinearize. So I'm going to present a new probabilistic interpretation of PCA, fairly briefly. And this interpretation can be made nonlinear. And the result is, therefore, a nonlinear probabilistic PCA. So I start with a bit of notation. So I've already said Q is the dimensionality of the latent space, D is the data space, and N is the number of data points. Y, I'm assuming, is centered data, and it's in the form of a design matrix. So it sort of has N rows and D columns. Um, the latent variables, again, n rows, q columns, and then I'm going to use a mapping matrix that maps between them. Okay, so the important thing... For the purposes of the math, the depth we'll go into, the important thing about that is that if you see y transpose y, that's a covariance matrix. If you see y, y transpose, that's an inner product matrix. So... Lots of kernel people get excited in a product matrices. So that's important, and that's important for different reasons. So linear latent variable models. This is what we were talking about here. Now, what I'm going to say is represent the data Y with a low-dimensional set of latent variables X and assume a linear relationship of this form where the noise is spherical Gaussian. So Y is just X times some matrix plus Gaussian noise. Probabilistic PCA. I'm going to define a linear Gaussian relationship between these variables and data, and then take the standard latent variable approach, define a Gaussian prior over the latent space. So there's my linear Gaussian relationship expressed as a probability distribution, and here's my prior over the latent space. Now what I would then do is integrate out the latent variables 
and I get this marginal likelihood here, which is independent across the data, data points. So it's a zero mean Gaussian with this particular covariance structure, WW transpose plus sigma squared i. Now what's interesting about that is if you look for the maximum likelihood solution, and this is what Sitting and Bishop showed, you can show, and the key points is, are basically in this line, this is just the log likelihood written out. If uq are the first q principal eigenvectors of n to the minus one times y transpose y, remember that's the covariance matrix, and the corresponding eigenvalues are lambda q, then w, this mapping uh, matrix, spans the principal eigenvectors of this matrix. So it's equal to uq times l. L is just a diagonal. It's the eigenvalues minus this spherical term. And v is just an arbitrary rotation. And it's typically in PCA taken to be just the unit identity matrix, which means that you end up with right angle uh, principal components. So that's quite nice, because what it's saying is that we've got a probabilistic model for which the solution for which is spanning the principal subspace of the data. Okay, so here's the new model. So define the linear Gaussian relationship. That's exactly the same. But a novel latent variable approach. So if we're going to be Bayesian about things, we're interested in marginalizing out x and w in effect. What I'm going to argue is, well, as from a Bayesian perspective, it's equally wrong to marginalize out x as it is to marginalize out, to not marginalize w as it is to mar uh, not marginalize x. So you define a Gaussian prior over the parameters w instead of over x. And then you get a marginal likelihood of this form, which is now independent Gaussians across the data dimensions with this xx transpose for sigma squared i covariance matrix. So it's the dual, basically, because I've integrated across an inner product, I'm integrating on the opposite side. Now, the nice thing about that, people familiar with kernel PCA will sort of be preempting this, is in this case, the dual probabilistic PCA maximum likelihood solution is very strongly related to the first one because, as you can see, if I flip between the two, you've got W's becoming X's, Y's becoming Y transposes, and they're very strongly related. So you just end up with this solution, the X, you're maximizing with respect to X now. So the trick here is you're taking a latent variable model, which in the probabilistic perspective, you normally integrate out parameters and maximize, integrate out, sorry, integrate out latent variables and maximize with respect to parameters. This is a new approach where you're saying, I'm going to integrate out the mapping, and then I'm going to maximize with respect to latent variables. So the solution for the latent variables is this set of eigenvectors, which is these eigenvectors of the inner product matrix. Um, and again, the eigenvalues are the same. Now, people familiar with kernel PCA will know, there's just a duality again, that the solution for probabilistic PCA, which is of this form, is strongly related to the solution for dual probabilistic PCA. And indeed, if you're performing kernel PCA, you substitute this inner product matrix here with the kernel matrix, and you solve for the positions of the embedding. You can't do this one in kernel PCA because your mapping, you know, your feature space could be up to infinite. So well, if your feature space is not infinite, you can still do this one. And the problem with the eigenvalue problem is the size of the feature space. Um, if this, if this eigenvalue problem is the size of the number of data points. So statisticians are well aware of this, and they operate with this one if the number of data is less than the number of features. So these two things are equivalent. Uh, in the probabilistic PC, you specifically assess uh, factor analysis. Mm. So uh, does the result hold for uh, factor analysis as well? So factor analysis, in some senses, this is a way of just introducing the model. Um, you can view factor analysis as what I'm about to talk about, the Gaussian process latent variable model. You can view it as a Gaussian process latent variable model if you do similar things to what we're going to do. This eigenvalue problem doesn't, so, doesn't hold. So the key component, uh, why is this solution, this fixed point solution, easy to find, whereas factor analysis isn't easy to find? It's important that this guy here, sigma squared, is diagonal. Otherwise, when you go through this um, uh, maximization, uh, there's a sherman morrison woodbury formula, and the sigma square can come out of one portion, but the diagonal term is inside an inner matrix inner product and can't come out um, on its own. So that's why there's this nice, elegant solution for probabilistic PCA, and there isn't such a nice, elegant solution for factor analysis. But you could modify factor analysis in the same way I'm going to talk about, because 
in a moment, we're going to throw away elegant eigenvalue problems and do nasty things. So at this point, um, I need to mention a little bit about Gaussian processes. So Gaussian processes are probability distributions over functions. And these functions are obviously infinite dimensional. So it's difficult to specify a distribution over something that's infinite dimensional. So the way you work with them is you specify a prior different, uh, distribution over instantiations of the function, which are finite uh, dimensional objects. So you take n data points from the function, and you specify a distribution over that. Now the problem is then is what do you say when someone gives you a new data point, an n plus 1 data point? Well, you can show uh, by induction that the Gaussian process is consistent. That it doesn't matter when someone gives you a new data point. For many distributions, if someone gave you a new variable, it's effectively a latent variable that you're marginalizing over. Think of a discrete example where there's an extra binary variable. The class of distribution suddenly changes when you add a new variable. For Gaussians, the class doesn't change. So it doesn't matter how many data points there are out there in the world that I haven't seen. If I haven't seen them, when they're marginalized, my predictions about the data points I do see stay consistent. So that's important. But once you've got that out of the way, you can just use them like you use regular Gaussians. So instead of a mean and covariance function, the GP is defined by a mean function and, and so instead of a mean and covariance matrix, the GP is defined by a mean and covariance function. And the mean function is often taken to be zero, just for simplicity. You can use mean functions, but they're typically taken to be zero. Covariance functions must be positive definite. And that sort of means that the class of valid covariance functions is the same as the class of Mercer kernels. So there's this strong parallel between Gaussian processes and kernel methods. Um, the key difference, I think, I would say between Gaussian processes and kernel methods is in kernel methods, you're often only interested in the posterior, what we would think of in Gaussian processes as the posterior mean function. In Gaussian processes, you're often interested in the variance of the posterior as well. But propagating that variance is often quite nasty, apart from the standard regression case. Um, and so for that reason, the algorithms are often a bit more involved and a bit uglier. So zero mean Gaussian process will denote it like this, where k is the covariance function or kernel. And the linear kernel has this matrix in a product form, so sorry, not in a, in a product matrix form, plus a diagonal term. That's what keeps it positive definite rather than positive semi-definite. So priors over nonlinear functions are possible, and you can sample from them. So this is a sample from that Gaussian with this kernel, uh, with a small diagonal term added to make it positive definite. Here's an RBF kernel, sample from a Gaussian with an RBF kernel as its covariance, kernel being computed on this input span here. So these are all different samples, each individual different sample. Here's different length scale, um, different variance, overall scale of the kernel, increasing its size. This is what we call the MLP kernel. This isn't uh, the, um, this isn't the ta hyperbolic tangent. This is an arc sine based kernel, which has a particular interpretation as a neural network with infinite hidden nodes. Um, this is like a point symmetric function, uh, which is based on the MLP kernel. So you can do lots of different functions. This is just a bias, just taking a constant and adding a little bit of diagonal. So, and this is the combination of a few of those plus some noise. So you can get all these different function classes out of the Gaussian process. So I'm going to skip through that bit. That's just Gaussian process regression. So with the dual probabilistic PCA, what I'd like you to see here is take a look at this guy here. Given that definition I've just said that a Gaussian process is just a Gaussian function with this particular covariance, inspection of the marginal likelihood shows that this is just a product of Gaussian processes across a few different dimensions, independent Gaussian processes. So we recognize that kernel as the linear kernel for the case we're talking about. And we call models of this class Gaussian process latent variable models. OK, so if we take the RBF kernel, we, can't, we can substitute this in, but it's no longer possible to optimize with respect to x by an eigenvalue problem. Because that eigenvalue problem I showed you earlier relied on that um, uh, factorizability of the kernel matrix plus a constant diagonal as the question there. As, as we talked about, even if you turn that into a non-constant diagonal, it's no longer an eigenvalue problem. So instead, we're going to find gradients with respect to x, alpha, l, and sigma squared, and optimize using conjugate gradients. So notice, not just with respect to x, but all the parameters of the kernel. However many parameters we've got in our kernel, we'll be optimizing with respect to those as well. So there's no setting of kernel parameters. 
Okay, so I want to show you an example of, you know, I cut some slides, so I hope there's not a discontinuity, because I cut some slides at this point, which means I have to sort of spend a bit of time explaining what's going on in the example. So this is a SIGGRAPH paper that used this model, modeling human motion data. So these white dots moving around here, this, this paper, I should say, is by um, Keith Grouchow, Steve Martin, Aaron Hertzman, and uh, Zoran Popovich. Um, it was a couple of years ago at SIGGRAPH. Now, what you see here is the latent space. I'll talk about the grayscales in a moment. What you see here is the data space. Now, you see these white points are points that are being input to the model and projected back into the latent space. So as the man moves, you see the projection back into the latent space. Now, markers have disappeared, and we'll play it again in a second so I can explain what happens with the markers disappearing. So, markers disappear once the pink man appears. So what's going on with the markers disappearing is that this is a visualization of this data with uh, white indicating the precision of the posterior mapping. So in white areas, it's confident about what goes on in this data space. In black areas, there's a higher variance because we've got a posterior distribution over functions here. So what he does is he takes markers off the arm and then off the upper body. And then he's filling in those remaining markers using this latent variable model. So the mapping from x to y. Because he's got the x position given this small subset of the markers. And he's asking, OK, now give me the y position. And I think the nice thing about this example is, it's, as far as the model is concerned, it's just a missing data problem. But as far as we're concerned, this is a very, very high dimensional data set, with, which you're very familiar with. And you can tell whether this is a natural walk or not. And he's only now providing, I think, six markers, uh, which are equivalent to three dimensions each. So 18 dimensions or something of the true 100 dimensional data set. Um, and it's doing a really nice job of reconstructing the data. And it can do that because it's a probabilistic model. And it's just treating the data as missing data, which is something that's very difficult for um, non-probabilistic models to do um, as easily. Once you've got this model, it's just a, it's just a matter of, of turning the, the handle, the standard probabilistic handle for missing data. So the other example I'd like to show you was an ICTV paper. There's actually nicer work. Uh, they do later work, which is even nicer than this. Raquel Ortizan, David Fleet, um, uh, Pascal Fuhr, and Aaron Hertzman. So this is tracking using the model. So they've got an image, and they're imposing, what you see on the image is imposing the three-dimensional track of the body. Um, as you'll see her turn, you'll see she skates towards the field of view, the front field of view. But the model can't deal with that, because that's out of plane. So it's basically taking an image using a prior model of walking, taken from a completely different sequence, in fact, a mocap sequence, and using it to 3D reconstruct from the image. And this is a golf swing example. Now, the interesting thing about these examples uh, is that this model is trained on, I think, uh, approximately 30 frames of data. So it's 30 frames of a different walker or 30 frames of a different golfer. And in fact, this drive swing, I think, is coming from the same model as the, uh, uh, the different model, sorry, a different sort of type of swing than the um, original data was taken from. So that's... Uh, reasonably impressive. And in fact, these aren't the sort of things I would have tried to do with the model because I wouldn't have thought it would do a great job. There's obviously lots of other important things about when you're doing that, about how you do the optimizations and so on and so forth. And I refer you to their papers to have a look at that. So I was sort of impressed with these examples. But one thing concerned me. And that thing was that in motion capture examples, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with motion capture data, but you actually have constraints on the locations of these uh, points given a skeleton structure. So it's not just simply a matter of points in a 3D cloud. So to my mind, well, the question in my mind was, what was actually controlling the naturalness of the motion? Was it the fact that there are constraints? Was the model just doing a sort of a half assed job of modeling where the points were, but then the constraints are taking over and doing the rest? So what interested me was, well, let's, I mean, this isn't the way one should do graphics, but you should just throw away all those constraints and take a three-dimensional point cloud. So that's what you'll see in this data set now. Um, and this is just sort of unpublished demo data that you can download. So this is like a guy I found online who's running. And what you see in the points now are actual 3D points rather than angles being projected into 3D space. So 
what I want to try and do is model that with the uh, GPLVM and then show that the latent space that the GPLVM comes up with gives me reasonable things, certainly close to the data. I mean, I don't expect it to be giving me something reasonable uh, away from the data. So that's exactly what this model is. Um, this also allows us to move into some sort of extensions and mention briefly some things about um, dimensional reduction. So what I have here is the latent space. Now, you might, we'll talk about why there are gaps in the latent space. Because the first thing you might notice is you expect this to be a continuous sequence. And indeed, in part, you can see continuous sequences. But there are jumps. And uh, we'll see where those jumps are in a moment. Uh, they're just x1 and x2 in this thing here. So they're just a two-dimensional. We're taking q equals to be 2. And that's the only thing we're giving the model. Well, actually, we give it an initialization as well, which in this case is PCA. And then we optimize x, which is we've told it to be a two-dimensional thing, and this is where it puts them. They're not meaningful in terms of I can rotate this solution, and it's the same likelihood. Or I can mirror it in both ways, and it's always the same likelihood. The only thing that's actually meaningful because of the RBF kernel that's being used in this case is the interpoint distances. So one way of viewing this is that you've got a data set with an RBF kernel, and you've got some observed data points. And you're trying to match the covariance coming from the RBF kernel to the observed uh, in a product matrix, the sort of empirical in, product, in a product matrix from the data. And the way you're trying to do that is by moving these points around in the latent space. And then this is at convergence where those points end up. So what I can do is, because I've got a mapping, I can sort of and that MATLAB isn't sort of really designed for graphics, so you get these points hanging around. I can move around and show you, OK, so here he's clearly doing a pace of the run. And in fact, here is the start off position of the run. Um, here is another pace of the run, which is aligned with that one, but at a different angle. And the same down here. So in both cases, he's running, but he's running at a different angle. So it's basically taken the data and aligned the, the positions of the run, but some of them are different angles, so he's put them alongside each other. But you might not like some aspects of this, because most dimensional reduction methods, in fact, all the ones before I started listing probabilistic ones, they, when they do dimensional reduction, look for something specific. They say, a good visualization is one where if two points are close in the observed data space. They are close in the observed latent space. Now, clearly, these two points are very close in the observed data space. And they are very distant in the observed latent space. So what's going on? Well, the GPLVM isn't looking to do that. The GPLVM is looking for a smooth mapping in the opposite direction. So it says, if two points are close in latent space, they must be close in data space. But that does not mean if two points are close in data space, that they must be close in latent space. In fact, it means that if two points are far in data space, where far is a very loose term, they will be far in latent space. So that's what means that the mapping is always smooth. So why does it go wrong? Well, the topology here is wrong. This run is uh, sort of cyclic run with changing angle. So what it can't do, because of the conserved length scale of the RBF function, is it can't decide to model this as a ring and capture the angle. And since it's not constrained, it gets higher likelihood solutions if it keeps these things together. But it's not constrained to keep these things together. Since it's not constrained to keep these things together, it chooses to split them apart. Yes, if you do, in fact, there's an example online where you do this experiment with three-dimensional latent spaces, and this problem doesn't occur. It draws it as a cylinder in a three-dimensional space with the um, angle of run going down the cylinder and the pace of the run going around the axis there. But in some sense, this is a purposeful example to show the model in a failure mode. Um, and it's also, I think it's interesting, it's enlightening about, well, I mean, it's interesting that we do spend most of our time working with dimensional reduction that doesn't exhibit this characteristic. Because if, um, if you think of a ball of string, I've got a one-dimensional space and I wind it around and around and around like a ball of string, now embedded in a three-dimensional space. If that string is infinitely narrow, some of those points in the three-dimensional space will actually map to the same position, um, uh, to different positions in the one-dimensional latent space because of a loop. 
So you can't actually specify how the ball is wound with a mapping from data space to latent space. The only way you can specify how the ball is wound is with a mapping from latent space to data space. Now, the problem then is if you've got the wrong topology, you won't necessarily be able to capture all the constraints in the output. So why do we always end up looking for mappings or preserving distances in the data space, in the latent space? Well, because typically those solutions are concave. The solution of where, if you want to do the solution in the other way, so think of the ball of string with a crossing loop. I've got a point on my latent space here, x, which is mapping out to the three-dimensional space to this point in my hand. But if I go all the way around there, it maps back to the same point again. So is that point around the loop once, or is it around the loop the other side? There's lots and lots of local minima, and you, you can't decide where it is as a result of that. And that's a problem for models like this that try and do this. There are massive multimodality in the latent space. But in a lot of cases, what we can do is try and deal with that multimodality by putting constraints on the model that we're interested in to try and smooth out this latent space. And really, that's what's going to I'm going to talk about next. I'm not sure how I'm doing for time. I can't see any. 15 minutes. Oh, short on time then. OK, so um, this is actually here drawn in the sequence as it goes round. So you see it does something roughly cyclic, um, ending up here and going round and round. But it, it, it's doing these breaks. So that is really what I've just talked about. So I'm not going to talk about that again. But what I'm going to say is what the modification is to fix this up. So because we're actually optimizing this weird thing of in X space, what we can do is we can sort of be inspired by low and tipping with their neuroscale algorithm I mentioned at the beginning and say, well, each point in latent space could be a smooth mapping from data space. And by making it a smooth parameterized mapping, constraining it in effect, we can then optimize over the parameters of that mapping instead of optimizing over X directly. So Joaquin, um, Quinoniero, Candela, and I had a paper on this at ICML last year. And uh, we called it back constraints. So we can use any smooth function, neural network, RBF network, or kernel-based mapping, sort of just without considering the variant. And tried all of these, and they all worked sort of really reasonably nicely. So normally, the GPLVM proceeds by maximizing this likelihood with respect to x, using gradients of the likelihood with respect to x. Now, by putting these back constraints in, we look to optimize with respect to B, where B are parameters. And we can compute B, the gradient of the likelihood with respect to B, via the chain rule, and optimize the parameters of that mapping instead. So back to the uh, example. So this is the same model, but with um, an RBF kernel-based back constraint, so a smooth reverse mapping. So now, what we see is that you can see the cyclic. I don't know why I can't. Let me try and make this smaller. OK. So as I go around this cycle here, you now see he goes through the run. And still, it's capturing, to some extent, the uh, change in angle. It, it isn't going to be capturing it as well, because if it were able to capture it as well like this, then the last solution would have gone there. Because the initialization is actually quite close to a cycle. The PCA initialization is quite close to a cycle. So it's not like that that's a local minima to be away from this cycle. It's actually the global minima I've tried. This has a lower likelihood as a solution than the other one. So there he is running away quite nicely. Um, and an interesting thing about that is that you can see on this plot here why one reason why it doesn't want to do that sort of thing. So this is like inner groove distor distortion on old long playing records. As it gets towards the center, it's got less length to represent the same cycle of run. So it doesn't want to do that. So it tries to flatten everything out into a sort of square type shape. Um, so here, it actually manages to keep the cycle of run the same length by having it like a cylinder a projection of a cylinder. It's like an isometric projection of a cylinder, what we're seeing. But of course, then it has to cross at some point. So these, these, these three points, approximately, where it's crossing here aren't the same in the real data. And it's now sacrificing quality of modeling of those three points to keep the back constraints, keep the smooth mapping. And now we've got a bijective. Well, we hope it's a bijective. There's no guarantee. But we've encouraged it to create a bijective mapping between the two spaces. Why is there no guarantee it's bijective? Because we're only imposing the constraints at these points here. And if that mapping isn't properly regularized between those points, these two mappings might not match up very well. 
Okay, so that's in case the demo didn't work. <laughs> oh, you want to see? oh, sorry, and in fact, I should have showed you that. Oh, should I show that at the end? Yeah, in fact, I should have showed you that because I wanted to. I wanted to have that in. Um, yeah, I forgot about that. Uh, so another thing that you can do with this model, because we've got P of Y given X, something people are interested in is you've got dynamic constraints on what goes on in this model. So you expect those two dynamically close latent, but two temporally close latent variables to be close together. And so I um, uh, uh, can't remember his first name, but Wang and Fleet and Hertzman suggested using Gaussian process dynamics. Now in this case, you predict where you're going to go next with a Gaussian process. Now. This is not Markov dynamics. I'm not going to go into why it's not Markov dynamics uh, just now, but we can talk about it afterwards if anything's interesting. Um, so you make a prediction where you are going to be at the next time frame. The reason it's not Markov dynamics is a little bit involved, so I'll explain that to anyone afterwards if they're interested. So it's an autoregressive process. So in that case, what we can do, oh, wrong one. There we go is have another look at the um, visualization. So now, because of this dynamics, the way I think of this dynamics is like a wind field. It's like within this X space, it's telling you where you're going next. So in this case, it's a, a is it cyclone or an anticyclone? Anyway, it's blowing it round the middle, round in circles. So what you can do now is show you can show the same sort of effect that you get the cycle, and you can also run the dynamics forward. So here, we're just taking predictions from the dynamics in a point-to-point -point basis, and you actually get a nice run until he gets to the center, where he just sort of takes smaller and smaller steps. Um, so uh, that's good. In the area outside the data, it's good, actually, in this case. But this isn't the example I would wanted to show you, because it's pretty normal in, inside where the data is. It's hard to find something where you can immediately say, oh, there's something wrong. Um, although, in the other example, uh, I'll show you, we can see that he does go wrong. So um, that's, that's quite a nice model. And what they've used this for is tracking, and they've actually used cases where you're tracking a human who disappears for an entire pace, and you still pick them up when they reappear. So you get full occlusion for an entire pace, and the dynamics takes over. And then you immediately, you actually get a good prediction of where they were while they were missing, as long as they don't start running while they were missing. And then you pick them up on the other side. And that's a CVPR paper by Urtizen, uh, Fleet, and uh, Thor and Hertzman, which took their ICV paper and added the dynamics in. OK, so that's about inner groove distortion. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just going to talk about this one final thing. So another thing we might be interested in is building hierarchies of these models. So this sort of low-dimensional embedding is an interesting way to handle high-dimensional data. But in probabilistic graphical models, um, they would sort of maybe say, well, the way to handle high-dimensional data is to express conditional independencies in the data. To say, oh, this node is conditionally independent given this one, and, and learn a sparse graph structure uh, to describe the data. It's a completely different approach to handling high-dimensional data. So what I'm interested in here is stacking Gaussian processes to consider more complicated hierarchies. So it's like a full, this is a simple one link in the graph. We're just going to put all these things together and make a creator stack graph. So this is a, an example of two subjects, subject one and subject two, walking together and, and uh, high-fiving. Um, and what you're seeing here is this top level node controlling both subjects and then each of the individual subjects being controlled independently. Because given, uh, your, um, given your position here, you know where the subject is. You don't need to know where the other subject is. This subject becomes independent if you observe them. So you're expressing that sort of conditional independence. The other one I have with a little demo on it is this example here where you actually make these conditional independencies on the body. So sorry, that green doesn't come out very well. But these are latent variables, and these are the observed angles of different portions of the body. And this is very recent work, um, and I'm kind of interested in it because I think it's two things I think this is interesting for. So this is an example of a run and a walk in the same model. Why is this interesting? It's interesting because, first of all, I have low-level control of the different components of the structure. I've got a run and a walk, which are quite similar here, but I could have a wave. 
as part of the model. And then I could have you walking with waving. Because I don't want to have to learn a run with a, a walk with a wave and a walk with a scratching the head and all these other things. I'd rather be able to separate how I'm learning these things. Um, I haven't really done that here because this is just an early sort of prototype example. Um, but what we've got is the ability to do a walk. Now, if I press this thing here, I run through the cycle of the walk. And you can see the green points are all associated with the walk. It doesn't know those labels. I've just colored them that way for visualization. And then, similarly, I've got the run. This runs a little bit slower because I'm sort of at the limits of what MATLAB seems to be able to do on my laptop animation-wise. Uh, mapping, each of these is a Gaussian process mapping. And I can just sort of work on the abdomen directly. So you can see that's what the abdomen does across the cycle. Or I can work with the legs directly from the walk. Or I can just take one arm and wave it back and forth. So it's a decomposition of the model. Now you'll notice I'm, all these examples, I've used very few data points. That is the domain where this model just destroys anything. Some of these examples, we've seen very high dimensional data sets, 100 dimensions, not very, you guys are used to more than that. But say 100 dimensions of data with 55 data points. And it's been, in fact, that all those uh, man walking examples have been that. And it's never done anything weird and outside the model. Normally, you would think that's linear model ter territory. But these are very nonlinear models to do this and to do it well. Now, you can also do large data sets. I haven't talked about that today. Um, I think there are still interesting models for large data sets. Um, but there's a lot of issues because of n cubic complexity in Gaussian processes. We've got that down to n d squared, where d is a um, hand-tuned sparsity parameter. Not d, because that's the dimension. I just say k where k is the hand-tuned sparsity parameter, which could be seen like as the number of support vectors in an SVM, but you have to set it by hand. Um, and I think that's about everything I wanted to show. Let's just get back to the talk, and that's just in case that demo didn't work. So in summary, the GPLVM is a probabilistic nonlinear generalization of PCA. It works effectively as a probabilistic model in high dimensional spaces, even when there are less data points than there are high dimensions. Um, these back constraints force these local distance preservations that are present in most dimensionality reductions techniques. And dynamics can be introduced, and there's a hierarchy. And that one finally doesn't exist anymore. So ignore that. And that's it. So we, ha we already had one sort of request, which means I have to run through the demos a little bit. <coughs> You know, well, I'm not gonna, no, no, you're not going to see them all again. Um, yeah, run with those run through. I like that. Yeah, very good. Um, so let me get this right. And then I think, yeah. So we'll see. This is the unconstrained case, and I'm, I, I'm supposed to be showing this because I'm supposed to show you new funky behavior that we'll do. So let's see. I need to get him at the right angle. I think the thing to watch is his feet. Okay, well, there you go. There's oh, yeah. Mr. Funky. So, obviously, there's no constraints telling him he can't do that. They're all smooth moves, smooth distortion away. And the data is not telling him anything there. So, actually, what the RBF covariance is doing is dropping back towards the mean. So, it, it's controlled by the data or wherever it is. But as you move away from the data, it typically drops back towards the mean. The MLP covariance I showed you earlier doesn't do that. And you will get less weird distortions with the MLP covariance. Um, but yeah, I think one time, I mean, the problem with developing these demos is you just end up playing with them. <laughs> okay. Was there a question there or was that there? Oh. <laughs> the observed data that you're modeling in these cases are the three dimensional locations of the actual points. Yeah, each, um, each uh, point you see on the screen is got 3D associated with it. So each blob you see on the screen has an XYZ loca location. And I think there's uh, 34 of them. So it's 103 dimensions, 102, whatever that is. Um, and there's 55 data points. Subsampled. MOCAP is typically at 120 frames. And we've downsampled to 30 frames uh, a second um, to do this. Because you don't need. Uh, apart from the uh, high-fiving thing, where one of the guys, he really hits the other guy, 
Um, that's the only time I've seen where the 120 frame per second uh, sample rate is actually necessary for the model to see what's going on because he moves a lot quicker across that and then their slap causes a rebound. So I'm not even sure the 120 frames is fast enough there. But in most of walking and running cases, uh, 30 frames per second is ample for this model. So when you do these hierarchical models, how do you train them? And how do you tell that this, this could be something for the, here we have the stomach and here we have the arm. And, uh, oh yeah, so the structure I can't do, and that would be really nice. But yeah, so for the human motion case, you can think of obvious types of structures that you might want to impose, but you're right, most data, you don't have that sort of information. Um, and learning any structure like this would be a nightmare. In fact, in this case, even learning the x variables, you have to be a bit careful because you're doing a map solution to x variables across multiple levels. Um, I have sort of reasons why I think that's all right and you don't overfit, uh, which are primarily dependent on the fact you've got a temporal prior on the top. And as long as your node models aren't overfitting and you've got this temporal prior on the top, and one thing I didn't mention is I constrain the Gaussian processes to be low noise in intervening levels. It seems to do a really nice job. If you allow the Gaussian processes in the intervening levels to have noise, then it um, starts to mess up. So you could do, you could do something where you say, excuse me, we don't have at all the dimensions we are kind of on the same scale. We have the luxury to let them find the dimensions. Well, you don't with angles. You do, I guess, you probably, it's right too in this case, but with angles you don't. Um, and what you can do there is, and what the sort of the modification that um, was suggested in the style-based IK paper for that reason, it's quite simple, is to actually associate each kernel with an additional parameter, which is a scale on that kernel and the variance jointly. So an overall scale, so the signal to noise ratio doesn't change. Now you could also, there's nothing wrong with saying, doing something more advanced. In theory, there's nothing wrong with doing something more advanced and taking, uh, taking the likelihood we saw, which was independent across dimensions. And I would, I mean, my claim is it's still a Gaussian process, latent variable model, if P of Y given X is a Gaussian process, independent or not. And, and even in the independent case, you get to this factor analysis type situation where you can specify a different kernel or different scales in the kernel. But a problem then arises if you start tinkering with the kernel too much. If you do an overall scale on the kernel, that's fine, and, and that's what these guys did. But if you start allowing different noise, signal to noise ratios, where that's the signal and that's the noise, then um, you need to compute the posterior kernel separately for every dimension. So, one thing I didn't say is the construction of this model as it is means the posterior variance is identical for all dimensions which is a slightly odd thing to have, but it means I can visualize it in that latent space and it reduces the computation. If the posterior covariance is different for every kernel, and this is the classic, people who are doing Gaussian processes have this problem all the time. If you're gonna propagate the variance, you've got to store it. You've got to look after that kernel. And if you allow it to be different in each dimension, you've got a multiply by D times storage, multiplied by D times complexity and so on and so forth. Um, in most cases, the model's so strong, it doesn't really need it, but I'm sure there are cases, in the cases we've looked at, even the angles, uh, but I'm sure there are cases where you would want that to be accounted for. Yeah. 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 Um, so, we have there's some classic benchmark data sets. I really like to use it for text, actually, but I don't know if it's useful for text. It's uh, already complicated because you start to look at multinomial output. Um, but text and speech, I'd love to do. So this is the evil um, Swiss roll, and this shows that without good initialization, it fails miserably. That's like someone sitting on the Swiss roll from the top. This is a local minimal problem. Um, these are some digits. So that's a particular case of linear back constraints, but there's other. This is an oil flow data set. Just skimming through these just to give an idea. This is um, a full visualization of a thousand data points. Um, that took all night with the full covariance function. Um, but it does a really good visualization. Uh, the, this is speech data of people making R all noises. And it's being used at a system in Washington for the two dimensional map is to replace a mouse for people who have difficulty with hands. So you've got R all and you move around. 
Um, that's not the system they've got implemented at the moment, but it's something they're looking at. Um, and that's the map of the different valves. Um, this is a robot localization example, which was at IJCII uh, this year, uh, where you've got a robot that goes around in a loop, reads Wi-Fi signals, and tries to decide where it must be in the two-dimensional space is actually a real map in that case. Um, and here's some digits. I said there were no other digits, but there are. This is just some missing data with handwritten USPS digits. So, you, so it does, yeah, I mean, it, really the thing is, it hasn't, um, it's interesting, it's taken off in a big way in vision and graphics. Um, at MIT, the talk was really crowded, and there were the machine learning people, the vision, and the graphics people there, because that's where they know uh, where things are. But I think that, I mean, the model's powerful anyway. The danger is, so what's in my head about it is, I mean, like, like you guys know about this thing of increasing data, and, and how performance keeps going up and up with increasing data. And speech people talk about that as well. So you've got evil Gaussian mixture models trying to model a high dimensional space. And they don't do it very well, but the more data you give them, the better they do it. And the more, you know, the people who get the best performing speech recognizers have the most data. And the people who get the best performing translation systems have the most data. So I'm hoping that with models like this, you can try and push back that trend. Because the reason that trend exists, to my belief, is that a lot of those data models aren't modeling high dimensional data correctly. Um, and in reality, humans, of course, don't need that much speech data, nowhere near as much as the best performing speech recognizers to learn to speak. So if you can start using different types of models, well, there's a child, children, children. <laughs> um, so the, the one, one hope, or you know, maybe a desperate hope, is that, yes, there are computational issues with this model, even with the sparse approximation. But is it the case that, and this is sort of swinging against current patterns in machine learning, is it the case that you can take smaller data sets, and what is the performance improvement curve like as you increase the data set? Does the improvement in the quality of the model mean that you get ahead of the uh, large data set that meets the same computational power? Because you can do something cool with this with 55 data points. So, I mean, for those human motion modeling, no one's really ever managed to do Gaussian mixture models with those at all. That's why the model's sort of been successful there. But um, I, the other thing I'm kind of very interested in is, is ideas for how you can take an algorithm like this, which is quite, uh, it's, I think it's difficult to parallelize, and how you can distribute it across multiple machines. Because it's not a great one for that either. So, so, so we, are, we are very much exploring all these issues. Is there anything about regulation that you would so um, text, people have visualized it. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I haven't thought as much about text to be top confident about the sort of assertions I make with uh, smooth manifolds in text as you might be with uh, other things. Um, you definitely need, I mean, you need start needing some pretty nasty stuff to do multinomial outputs on uh, this model. So I'm th sort of thinking that language models um, are certainly models that suffer from sparsity of data and require large amounts of data, yet it's not something we actually suffer with. And there is people look at things like clustering concepts and so on and so forth. So to me, the similarities between that and reduced dimensionality spaces, I don't think, I wouldn't claim that this model is close to being able to compete with the top approaches in that, because I think it needs a lot of engineering to get the representation right. This example is uh, Bernoulli noise models on the digits on the right-hand side. So you can do discrete, but of course, discrete text has other interesting issues like massive sparsity, um, which isn't the case for this. But you see, so you can certainly do discrete, um, but you're not going to be doing particularly large data sets. Uh, dimensional reduction in, this, in text data, I think, is an interesting area. They had this uh, paper, uh, again, I guess from the perspective of Google, quite Mickey Mouse, the stochastic neighbor embedding, where they were trying to show that you could embed text concepts um, together uh, in multiple places. They were trying to reflect. So the GPLVM has the right characteristic of this bank task everyone talks about. Banks are on rivers, and banks are financial institutions. So they mapped multiple places in latent space. 
Well, that's exactly the same thing as a two points crossing in the ball of string. Um, the, in the late, uh, in the, when you unwind the string, they're in different places, but in the observation space, they're in the same place. And what tells you in different places is things like context and so on and so forth. Um, and this model has all that capability. It does that. But whether it does what you can do with a model that doesn't have that capability, not at the moment, and probably nowhere near. But um, yeah. All right. Yeah. Oh. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, two-dimensional point, if you gave it two points, yeah. it would uh, just give you like an interpolation between them. It wouldn't, it was difficult. In fact, you can't really do two points because the whole thing's reliant on distances. So although it's a two-dimensional space, you're thinking of fitting lines, but it's, that's not the right quite way to think of it, because what's in the RBF kernel with two points, you basically have uh, two distances you can vary, two parameters in the kernel. So you would have to fix them at some distance apart, because uh, otherwise it can't resolve, because there's no other points. But it would just um, give you an interpolation between the two points, basically. Oh yeah, you can. That's pretty much what you can do. In fact, so Mitch, when I first did this paper, um, I uh, realized that this was going to be very slow, and realized that NIPs don't like it if you show data sets of like 60 data points. Uh, traditionally, NIPs people want very large data points. So what I did was I had a sparsification algorithm, which uh, was designed to be a Gaussian process-like thing of the SVM, and it does that very well. But it's an active set selection algorithm. And it just selects an active set and decides to work on that. Now, active set selection is very good in classification. In regression, it's typically not as good. Um, and this thing is basically a massive regression system. So what, basically, what my system did was take a subset of the data set that was laid out across the latent space, subsampling it from 3,000 points to 100. 